everyone thanks for tuning in this is episode number 95 i want to thank you for taking the time to join me uh, along with this podcast i pray that it uh, ministers to your heart that the lord speaks to you through it and i just uh, appreciate all those even across the world who are uh, tuning in for this i just bless you all and i thank you so today's kind of a hodgepodge (laughs) A kind of a uh, combination of many different maybe topics or uh, aspects that I want to just kind of touch on. I don't anticipate this being a long episode, but you just never know with this type of thing. So uh, we'll just see what happens. Today I was kind of reminiscing on a writing that I had put together. It was back uh, July 19th of 2021, and it was just in a morning study and I had written the question, how, how we define the gospel says a lot about where our treasure is. I think that's a profound statement because I, do, I, believe, I believe it reflects truth. How we each define the gospel. And, and let me say this. I have heard the gospel uh, described in many different ways. And and I will also say that many of those ways reflect truth. And as we find ourselves in a varying um, denominational expression, we will find Uh, unique aspects that each of those different denominations will cling to the most. They have particular passions that they advocate for. And a lot of times when we we define what the gospel is, we will find that those passions will be predominant in our definition of things. When when we're passionate about something, we define it a way that caters to our perspective. Now, like I said, though, there are many of those definitions that I've heard that do reflect truth. So it's not to say necessarily that one is greater than the other. However, I do believe that there are aspects to learn from each definition. Now, there are some who would hear this and and think there cannot be multiple definitions of the gospel. And I understand I understand your your question or your you know interjection at this statement. However, how we understand and define things is limited to our perception and also our ability to express or communicate. So how, how we see something, how we see and understand things will tilt the way we express something. And two, we, we all have varying degrees of expression, of, of ability to communicate. So there's factors that go into, into how we express thoughts. And it's not, it's, not always, it's not always so easy. And as I said, experientially, I have seen different um, attempts to define even something as central as the gospel. The word gospel means good news. So when I was writing this last year, I asked the question, how, how we define the gospel says a lot about where our treasure is. Because 
again, as I said, what you're passionate about will will be most reflected in your definition of what the good news actually is. Because I am a lover of of really church history and history of of persons that God used throughout the course of time uh, in 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 various forms of ministry. I have I have been exposed to many different uh, passionate pursuers of God, and they will have unique expressions that they have been that they have discovered by way of you know, revelation in Scripture or uh, God speaking to them, giving them a, a an issue, an order, a command to do this thing in ministry. And we often forget that as followers of Christ's uh, of Christ that we are we are blocks being built into a building a church a body one's called out in service to God we are unique blocks fit in this tapestry of God and as he as he uses us in his building we can express the thing in which we can contribute to God's work. And we often think because, because I am a block of this nature, you must too be a block of this nature. This is the definition of what a block should be, when in reality, that's not how God has done it. He has made us each individually unique, faithful to God, mind you. Don't don't ever take that out of the equation. Must there must be faithfulness to God, and as He, as He communicates to you what you're, what you're becoming in the whole tapestry of God, you must be faithful to that. But we often judge others by the revelation or the understanding that we have, that God has given us. And this is where we fall into this this kind of legalistic paradigm is when we is when we use our understanding as a judge or as a as a ruler, a measuring stick of um, of others. So so our definition of the gospel reveals where our treasure is. And so as I wrote that last year, I, I wanted to attempt myself even how how would i define the gospel um keeping in mind we must keep in mind the essence of the gospel is good news there must be integral to the the definition itself must be good news now it's easy to get misguided in as we attempt to wrestle with this word gospel, it's easy to get misguided and focus on a aspect or another aspect. And so often that's what happens in the Christian expression is we cling too heavily to an aspect of uh, the revelation of the gospel rather than looking at the gospel as a whole encompassing thing, the full spectrum, the full counsel of God. So keeping integral to the, to the word gospel, this good news component. So as I reflect on what I wrote, I'm going to read it to you. Um, as I reflect on it, even now, a year later, I can see that as I have changed as a person, and here's this word that many would probably hate, evolved in, in my understanding and in my own revelation, and again, how even my communication would change. How I would communicate things a year ago is not necessarily how I would communicate them now, even down to the word choices. We get stuck in these ruts, and it's hard to get out of them because it's it's bogged down deep into the rut, and it's created these high walls, and it's hard to get over that same rut that you've been traveling in. Water, think about water going down a path. It cuts deep into a place, and once it cuts out a, cuts out a rut, 
it's nearly impossible for water to then venture outside of those ruts where all this rain we've been having at where we live we have a gravel driveway i have a firsthand experience with this issue of water creating ruts and once water starts that it's hard to get it to go to places where it should and stay out of places it shouldn't so even heading into this you know, my attempt to def to define, I would urge you and caution you. Increase the capacity of your ability by way of, a of asking God to help you. There's no other way that this can come. God must um, open our eyes to see, to get out of these ruts, these walls that we build up that prevents us from seeing holy. And that's W H O L L Y. To see wholly what it is that God has made available to us. Okay. That was a uh, quite an extensive prelude there. Didn't see that one coming, but I, I, I do feel that it is important to say. So, my attempt at defining the gospel is as such Jesus was birthed born as God, lived also as man, did the work of the Father, died on a cross for my sins, rose on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father, making available heaven eternally to me, that I may be where he is forever, if I would repent and be saved, taking full advantage of his shed blood for my insufficient righteousness. Being reunited to God by the blood and body of Jesus, I can live a life of power in word and deed, walking in obedience to God, made visible by the Holy Spirit as living water flows from me to a barren wasteland around me. I have become a child of God, operating in the kingdom of God, while with access to the infinite riches of Jesus the Christ, living with, in, and through me, as I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. By faith, I'm saved, and by faith, nothing is impossible to a child of God and family to King Jesus." So this, this is my one year ago attempt at trying to define the gospel, remembering it's good news. And as I process what I said here, um, much of this continues, really all, all of it continues to, to hold a, a place of truth in my heart. I would express it the same exact way. The only thing that a year later now, the only thing that I would even modify in this, as I as I experience it again, I had mentioned that you know, well, two things really. I start out by expressing Jesus was birthed, born as God. So in my attempt to define the gospel, I started at the birth of Christ. I think if I had it to do over, I would add a kind of a, a prelude to that statement because. I, I would want to express the fact that Jesus is eternal in the sense that he always was, never came into being um, as a created one, but rather was always. John 1 tells us in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John continues to write on as we read through there that that Jesus is the Word. So he connects for us the fact that Jesus is the Word. And he says, in the beginning was the Word. So in the beginning was. So Jesus was he has always been and, and has always existed, never created, never um, underneath as a, as a co-equal with God, being God himself. So I think if, again, if I had it to, to modify, I would add in at the beginning of this 
this eternal relational intimacy of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Um, and so that I would add some, some component of that to the beginning. The other thing that I would modify um, now at this point is, uh, I mentioned he rose on the third day, ascended to the right hand of the Father, making available heaven eternally to me that I may be where he is forever. I, I love that part, that, that I may be where he is, because I think too often we as Christians place an emphasis on heaven and rather than being where God is. You see, we have a, a very... Um, a very impactful perspective of heaven based on um, a Plato and even with in as it relates to hell and with Dante but but I think I think that it's important for us to disre obviously heaven is a place the Bible speaks of it and and I'm not downplaying this. But what I am wanting to downplay is our emphasis on heaven. You see, heaven is where God is. His, his, it's the place in which that, that he has created. It's a place he has created, brought into existence. And of all that the Bible speaks of, it's beauty and wonder and elegance. But without the king present, it's just a place. So it's not so much that I want to emphasize heaven itself, but rather I would exchange that language ascended to the right hand of the Father, making available. I would plug in eternity because let me just, let me just be honest and transparent. I don't care. I don't care about heaven in the sense of the place. I'm interested in being where God is. To be in to be in in perfect oneness of fellowship with Christ, with with Jesus, with the with the Father God and with the Holy Spirit. It can be heaven could be in a in a trash can for all I'm concerned. If I get to be where he is, then that will that is heaven to me. Now, again, don't get feathers ruffled in that type of uh, in that type of dialogue, because I'm va violating the components of what the Bible has explained. Heaven, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I, I believe it. But what I want to do is de-emphasize heaven as this place of. I get to go to rather than a person I get to be with. That's so important. And that will change, that will transform your mind, it will transform your heart to, to sh make that shift. I and mean, we've done it in our presentation of, of the gospel in hopes of salvation. We try, we try to sell this place called heaven. And, and we've subconsciously or without even knowing created a place absent of the person of whom we go to to be with in this place so that's what that's an exchange that i would make i would change i would i would kind of withdraw this language of making available heaven eternally to me but rather i would change it and say making available eternity to me that i may be where he is forever so as i as i um as I look through this expression, those are the two components that I would modify. I love the language of everything else. I think it does, um, it does communicate a, a, a broader spectrum of what God has made available. The good news of living victoriously in a life of power in word and deed. 
in what we say, in what we do, walking in obedience, the Holy Spirit, how he flows from us and changes these wastelands around us into, into rich, flourishing gardens. Our, my identity as a child of God operating in his kingdom is one of the most reoccurring things that Jesus preached, the kingdom of God. He didn't, he didn't go around preaching, follow this law, follow these rules so that you can, he preached the kingdom of God. It's his rule, the rule and reign of God through, by way of the son, Jesus Christ. And what so many, what so many have gotten so greatly offended by this, by this idea or by this this propagation of, of prosperity in Christianity. But, but in Christ, we have the infinite riches of Jesus. That's not, that's not only, um, that's not only a materialistic component, although God blesses materially and, and, and when that comes, praise God for it. And when it doesn't praise God anyways, we're not ruled by, by this, by this richness, but we have in Christ, he is, he is the infinite, infinite of infinity. And so are we settling for less than? I think yes. I think yes. But we don't let those things rule and dominate our thinking. That's when things go awry. When we take something, let it rule and reign in our, in our perspective, we take our eyes off of Christ. No, we want to cling to all that he's made available. And again, as I've said before, I'm a lover of, of all things past in terms of what God has done. I think it's so important to, to understand that, to study that, because it helps us in the future. It helps us, it gives us, it builds this hope, this faith. If God did it before, he can do it again. And so um, just as that component um, builds in this, I, I, I like this definition. I would modify it in those couple ways. When I think about just, you know, if I didn't have, a, if, if I didn't have this kind of time to explain how I would define it, I think I was thinking about this morning to just two words, um, how would God, um, how could I define the gospel in two words? And it would be this, God's grace. It's his grace. Giving something that is not deserved. God gives something not deserved. And so I think God's grace encompasses all of this in, in uniquely two words. His, it's his grace that... I am saved. It is grace that he came, that, that Christ came and lived as he, as a perfect substitute died. It was grace that God raised him by the spirit back to life to, to eternally stamp his message of truth and validity. It was, it, it is grace that I can repent and be saved. It is God's grace that I can take full advantage of of his shed blood. I can receive it. There is a cooperation that happens in, in the saving grace of God. He extends it out to all who would come to him and drink, who all, who all would believe in the name of Jesus Christ. It is a cooperative act. And it's not by work that I do this, that I obtain anything. It's because I can love him because he first loved me. He extended this gift. He extended this gift. And I can take full advantage of it by receiving it. How? Not by working for it, but by faith, by the grace of God. So it's God's grace. It's God's grace that he, he has made me a child of God. And it's by grace that I can operate in the kingdom of God. It's grace that he gives me the infinite richness of Christ. And it's by grace that I'm seated with him in heavenly places. So two words. What is the gospel? God's grace. 
as I dial it back to take a bigger a bigger view, um, it is it is wholly en- encompassing. And um, so I think this is where we'll end it. Um, I had a couple other items to talk about, but um, as this is already now getting longer, and I, I think this, I, I feel satisfied with how this is. I, I hope that um, it gives you an encouragement. Um, I hope that um, if it has perhaps ruffled your feathers in some way, I pray that um, that would cause you to get into the Bible to discover what perhaps um, you either you're confident in or what you could draw from the Word of God. Um, but I pray it's an encouragement. I pray that it sheds light on areas maybe you hadn't considered before. Um, and uh, I truly I truly pray that the Spirit would use this and multiply it and, uh, and cause you to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and what He has made available. So I thank you for taking the time. And we'll see you on the next one. God bless. If I'm close to you, I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here with you.